Welcome to the second part of this series of tutorials looking at various ways of working with Digimap data. This particular tutorial is going to be looking at how we can use Grasshopper to generate a pseudo woodland using custom trees generated through a recursion method and then fed through Galapagos and Kangaroo to form a representative mesh and forest. Um, as I said, this is going to be Grasshopper heavy. Um, we'll be doing some small prep work in Rhino beforehand, um, but the additional plugins you're going to need for Grasshopper are listed in the video description. And they are Cockroach, Anemone, Weaver Bird, and Pufferfish. Because I'm using Rhino 7, I have Kangaroo version 2 built in. If you don't have Kangaroo version 2, if you're on Rhino 6, um, you can still get that from Food for Rhino. Um, Remember, you might need to unblock some of these files before you install them because they've been downloaded from the internet. And don't worry so much about, say, an enemy um, saying that it's about seven years old at this point. It's still working perfectly fine. And it works for this. So, without further ado, we'll start setting up a Rhino file for us to work in. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to need to import two separate layers from our Digimap bundle. The first is the uh, Topo standards, and the second is the Train5 DTM. The DTM stands for Digital Train Model, and that's the point cloud we're going to be using to generate the mesh. Now, if we start with the Train5 DTM, and we want the XYZ file, so we drag and drop, import, is comma delimited, so make sure that's uh, checked, and we want it to create a point cloud as that reduces computational stress on Rhino. So if you type in ZEA or Zulu Echo Alpha, and here we go, that's our mesh imported. So I'm going to work in perspective, and I'm going to set the view to northeast isometric and just save that as mesh isometric because we'll also be working at the origin as well. So if I just create four different layers I'm going to change the color of the train mesh to light gray. Grasper export to a dark green for obvious reasons. Woodland boundary is going to be red and the 2D boundary which is going to be the mesh boundary. In fact I'm just going to rename that as mesh boundary it is also going to be red. Okay, so I'm going to make sure that's on the train mesh for now, and I'm going to hide that layer. Next, we're going to go back and import the master map topo, which is a DWG. We do import and standard options. Now, we are not going to need the entire file, so we're going to isolate the layer we need and delete the rest. The layer we need is a vegetation area. So I'm just going to lock that for now. Select everything else, delete. And now the specific two I'm looking at are these two particular hatches right now. So if you select these two hatches, and I'm just gonna lock them, and then I'm going to delete everything else. Now I'm going to unlock them. I'm going to do explode then I'm going to use dupe border command and then I'm just going to delete the surfaces. The only boundaries that are going to matter are these two exterior ones. So again, we can lock those and delete the rest. Okay, so if we just put those into woodland boundary and we will change their display color to by layer in the properties box. Okay, we can lock that and then type on purge. I'm going to uncheck layers for now and that's everything else purged and we can just select the layers that import and delete them. Okay. So now we've got our woodland boundaries, we can switch that layer off. We can turn the terrain layer back on. Now, 
I'm just going to create an arbitrary square that's going to be roughly around this area here. So you can see where the faint outline of the woodland boundary is beneath. So I'm just going to create an arbitrary rectangle. I'm going to make sure that I've got points selected on OSNAP. And I'm just going to select one point. I'm then going to use the P command so I can select an individual lengths. I'm going to set for an arbitrary 1600. Should give us enough breathing space. And then set the other side to an arbitrary 1000. And that gives us enough. So next thing I'm going to do, block the mesh layer, and I'm just going to manually drag that rectangle up so it's encompassing. Now, next thing we're going to do is just going to make sure it's locked to a particular point. Okay, so that's done. And that's already in the mesh boundary layer. So for this, we can lock woodland boundary, grass hopper export, because all we need are the train mesh and boundary, and I've just unlocked the terrain mesh there as well. Last thing I'm going to do is select the mesh boundary and use the set point command to make sure that it's on the um, naught of the z-axis. I don't think that's strictly necessary but for me it's just neatness. Okay, now that's done. If we save the file and open up Grasshopper. Yep. One thing I am going to try and start doing in this tutorial is separating out when I speak and when I type because I'm aware this is a clicky keyboard and despite my best efforts in audition later I have no doubt that some of the clickiness will remain. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to expand it, we're going to the cockroach tab, and we need two functions from cockroach. First is point cloud, and the second is cloud explode. Next up, we want a curve container, so just double click and type in curve. And then we're going to want to have the So if we go to curve and then analysis and then point and curve and then we go to sift. So type in sift. Sift pattern is what we're wanting. And then dispatch. And dispatch. And then a point container. And then the final one we're using is the Delaunay mesh command, followed by a mesh container. Now, I'm going to just show you a couple of things in the Grasshopper UI. Firstly, if we go to Display and then Canvas Widgets, I have Profiler enabled. This is going to be useful all for us later on, because if this is enabled, this has this little pop under Widget, which shows you how much time each particular um, module takes. And since there are going to be elements that do take significant amount of time later in the tutorial, it's just going to be useful to see exactly how long they take. Now, if you want to change the threshold, if you go to File and Preferences, and then you can see Show Profile Widget there and the threshold for which it will start reporting. I've set it to more 0 milliseconds so I can see everything. Okay, so if we start joining these elements up, now I'm going to just lock the solver. So cloud goes into cloud and then the P of explode goes into the P of in curve and the curve goes into the C. Then we have the relationship R going into the sift pattern P. 
and then we have the point list from the explode function going into L. Now we're going to want to zoom in on the sift and see the plus mark there. We're going to want to expand that because we have three variables coming out, or three categories. And we're wanting category number two, because category number two tells us which points are inside our bounding box. So two then goes into P of dispatch, and then the L again is connected to the P of the exploit function. And then the point container goes into the Delume points and the mesh output goes into the mesh container. Now, I'm going to, at this point, push my grasp window to the side to reveal the mesh, select the mesh, and then, sorry, not the mesh, the point cloud. Right click on the cloud function and set one cloud. And then I'm going to hide that mesh for a second, and then I'm going to do with the mesh boundary. So select the mesh boundary and set one curve. Now, with all that said and done, I'm going to turn the previews off for these, apart from the dispatch function, oh no, with the dispatch function, and only have previews up for the point container and the mesh container. So I'm going to unlock the solver now so it runs. And then I'll show you in the dispatch container which of the two elements we're going to be dragging across. So you can see, as I said, this explode takes about half a second. The point and curve function takes just over six seconds and the dispatch around three. So you can see this is already quite helpful to tell us where exactly um, the I guess, um, choke points are in any particular script. So with the dispatch, we can see we've got about 60,000 points in the top and every other point in the bottom. So the ones we've been isolated are in column A, so that's what we drag into the point. And you can already see those points highlighted there. Now, we can now hide the point cloud and bingo, you can see our mesh generated for us. So, bake that mesh into terrain mesh, and that's done for us. So, we no longer need that point cloud, and we can just delete it. And we can delete that script too. So, this is the bare minimum we needed to do to set the Rhino file up for now. So I'm just going to throw that back into the mesh isometric and you can see roughly if I throw this into Arctic how that looks. And this raised mound here is where our trees are going to be spawning. So if I throw this back into wireframe, I'm going to save the file. We're going to start on the first step of the larger grasshopper scripts, which is the recursive generator. So this point I'm going to type in point in Rhino and then I'm going to type in naught 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 for the origin and I'm going to type in cell point and then I'm going to do Zulu Sierra to take us back to the origin. Now I'm going to zoom out slightly and that'll do then I'm going to set that as origin isometric. So we've got another anchor from which to return to. Now I'm going to push that to the sides run Grasshopper up, and we're going to start working on this script. So, the step one, and that is going to be creating the trunk of the tree, and that's quite a simple process. So what we're going to want is construct point, and then we're going to want a point container again, along with unit Z, which is specifying that we want the trunk to be moving along the z-axis and then we're going to want an arbitrary number slider so I'm just going to do a length of 0.0 to 10.0 I mean, we're again, remember we're working in a scale of 1 to 1000 so basically I'm saying the trunk's anywhere between 0 and 10 meters although 
realistically, of course, the trunk is going to not be naught. So I'm going to set it to four for purposes of this exercise. Now we want line and specifically we're looking at line SDL. So if we connect the point container up and then point goes into S, unit Z goes into D and our slider goes into L. Now you can see that branch is actually down there so I'm going to zoom in slightly. Now construct point is by default constructing it naught naught naught. That's fine. We don't need to change that. That's what we're looking for. And so I'm going to put in one more curved container. And I'm going to name that curved container trunk. I'm going to switch the previews off. Now, I'm going to put in the start and end points from the Anemone um, plugin. And this is our recursive start and end loop and then we're going to um, build the loop itself. So first things first, we want loop start. A number slider which is going to control the number of recursions we have. So minimum we're going to have one recursion. And then maximum to your heart's content. However, I would caution against going too crazy. I'm doing a maximum of 10. Realistically, I'm going to be working with three to four recursions. So if we put that into N, and I'm just going to rename that as recursion. And then we want a button. So we can toggle the loop to reset itself. And then the trunk goes into D0. Now, we also want loop end. I'm just going to push it over here for now. Now, the loop start, which is that arrow symbol, goes into loop end. And then we also want another toggle. Here we go. And now, the D0 there is going to connect into the start of our loop, and the D0 there is going to be connected by the end of our loop. And then this D0 will be our output. So I'm just going to put in a curve container and label that recursion output. So the background to this particular um, element of the tutorial was, in fact, my self learning of the last two weeks how to do this. Um, through a couple of different channels, one called Parastorm, the other one called DCO Parametric. Um, the links to the, all of the tutorials and resources I've used for this particular exercise are also in the video description. And if you're interested in the background to any of them, I heartily encourage you to take a look. So, with that done, we need another curve container. And this first element, we're starting to look at some of the parameters to shape the branches and how, you know, what the dispersion is going to be and how much the projection is going to be in their length. So we're going to want to analyze that curve. So we want endpoint, curve endpoints. And then we want vector two points. So type in vec two point followed by unit v or unit vector amplitude and a number slider I'm going to do an arbitrary number slider between 0 and 2 for this that's sorry that's 0, 0.0 to 2.0 for this slider can be a decimal I'm just going to plug that in there and I'm going to set it to 5 for now. So the unit vector is going to plug into the V there and the vector output from vector 2 points into the unit vector curve start and end points are going to be the A and the B and then the curve of course plugged into the curve inputs of the end points. And then this itself is going to be plugged into another 
um, element. So we want to analyze the length of the input curve. So if you type in length, and we drag the same curve down into that. Now, we're going to do another scaling maneuver here. So we want division. And I'm just going to do a random number slider again, probably between one and four, maybe six. So the length goes into A, this particular number slider goes into the B, and then this gets multiplied together. So we want multiplication. So the amplitude goes into A and the division goes into B. So I'm just going to rename these two sliders so you have a better idea of what they do. This one I'm going to label as branch offset. And this one I'm going to label as branch shortening. Now, the next element we need to do is ensure that the branches are in fact going to be on the correct plane and going to be offset um, in a pseudo-randomized fashion. So to that end, we're going to need the P-frame block. And we're looking for the singular perp frame rather than perp frames. So the singular perp frame we need to construct domain. And I'm going to put in arbitrary number sliders of 0, 0.0 to 1.0. I personally have yet to play around with this particular domain function much, but I prefer to have the customization there rather than not. And then we put the domain output into the T of the P-frame. And then again, we're pulling the curve down into the C of the P-frame. Next, we want to create a circle. And that's the circle with the orange box, because we're just looking for a plane of reference and a radius. So plane of reference has come from the perpendicular frame. And then the radius. I'm going to put in a value for 0, 0.0 to 4.0. So 0, 0.0 to 4.0. And yeah, I'm repeating myself for clarity. And then we need the move block. And the multiplication goes into the T because that's going to be the amount it translates by and the vector it translates across and then the C the circle is the geometry we're moving. So this number slider here that's going to be the branch radius. Or branch dispersion dispersion radius if you prefer. So next we're going to want the populate geometry. Now it's populate geometry function. And then we're going to want two number sliders here, one for the seeds and the other for the number of branches. So number of branches into the n. And random seed into the s. We don't need to worry about the p function. And the g goes into the g. OK. I'm just going to group all of these variables over onto the left for ease of access in the future. Now, one cool thing about Grasshopper, if you select a group and then you see these functions, kind of arrows and everything around it, you can tell it to organize certain blocks. So I'm going to just group all of those on the left-hand side for now. 
like you would use justify in Word or something. Okay, so all of these blocks are going to culminate in two point containers. First point container is our start point, which is the end point of the trunk or the previous branch. So from the curve end, drag that all the way into the top point container, and then points we've generated here, these go into the bottom point container. And then we're going to want the graft function. Graft tree. This is a database management function, so this is going to have um, a certain number of points to it, and this is going to have another certain number of points, and they're going to be in slightly different levels of data trees. If we graft the top one, this ensures that it's in the same arrangement as the bottom one, and thus we get our um, lines created in a same manner, as opposed to a slightly weirder manner. So finally, in the bottom, we're going to want to go into Kangaroo 2 and Utility at the end, and then remove duplicate points, and then drag the point into the top P. From here, line, and that's the basic line function, not the line SDL, and then T and Q into A and B, respectively. Now, this L, that is our loop output, so that goes into the D naught on the left side of the loop end. Okay, so this, this internal function here, this is our basic loop. Now we can connect up D naught into our curve input. So, I'm just going to push that to the side for now. If we save the script, And now I'm going to show you how this works. So, if we press the reset button, you can see it did a thing very quickly. So, first thing we need to do is we've got a lot of ads. So, we need to check that everything's connected as it should be. Now, on the loop start, we need to right click on a D naught on the right hand side and click flatten. Now, the next thing we need to do is if we go to our variables and just make sure that they are all roughly where we want them to be branch dispersion radius, if I take that to say two for now, number of branches, if we start off with three, random seed, any number, and then three recursions. Now, next on the loop end, if we right click on loop end and where it says record data, we click that, so we're seeing both the endpoint as well as all the points in between, so we can see the full output. Now, if I reset both end and start and run it again, you can see every single variable in there having been generated. Now, we do not need to see all of them, so at this point, I'm going to switch the preview off for everything internal. And now you can see this is our tree. Now, I'm just going to show you a couple of the different settings and how they work. So, branch shortening. If I run that again, you can see evidently it's all got a bit tight, more tightly packed. And then if I do, say, branch offset by one, you can see already it's gotten significantly more dispersed. And then if I switch to dispersion radius and decrease that some, run it again. Again, it's gotten very more tightly packed and a lot more upright. So 
there are lots of variables which you can play with and as I said, go crazy, have fun. For the purposes of this exercise, we're looking at creating vaguely deciduous trees. So this shape, this will do us. So the next trick I'm going to show you is how to clean up. So if you select everything except for the variables on this internal loop here, and then right click and then go to cluster, suddenly this is one function. And suddenly our board looks a hell of a lot neater. What I would encourage you to do for the sake of your insanity is to go through this particular cluster and rename as appropriate all of the inputs on the cluster itself. So you know, not just on the number sliders, but where on the cluster they plug into, just in case something goes wrong. That's what I would encourage you to do at this point. So I'm going to save and we're going to move on to the second step. So for this, what we're going to do is isolate the outermost endpoints of the branches we've generated. To do that, we're going to need to do some simple math along with what's called a lexical operation using the path mapper module. So to begin with, we want two number containers. First one, number of branches. Second one, number of recursion. And we also want a list length. And I'm going to rename that recursion output. So if we drag number of branches from the variable and number of recursions from the variable, the next trick I'm going to show you if you right click on the branches and go to wire display, hide. And wire display and hide again and suddenly again it looks a lot neater and this allows you to still, when you click on it you know where it's coming from but when you're looking at the entire picture it doesn't look quite so messy. So next up we do the same with the recursion outputs, drag it into list length and we're going to want to flatten the input so right click on the left and click flatten. And again, Y display and hide. Now, we want the expression function. And some simple math in here. We're going to want another variable. X, Y, Z as variables will do for this exercise. Now, if we double click. Now, what we're going to want to do is type in the following form formula, and that is Z minus open brackets, these are the curvy brackets we're using, X circumflex, which in this also means to the power of, and then open another bracket, Y plus 1, close both brackets, and then OK. Branches, recursions, and recursion output go into X, Y, and Z, respectively. What this is telling us is at what point in the list we're going to need to split it to ensure that the only points we get are the last of the endpoints of the final recursion, also known as the last set of branches we generated. So we're going to want to the split function. split list specifically and then the recursion output goes into L and again we're flattening L and I'm going to hide and then the R goes into the I for split. We're going to want B. I'm pushing that into a curve container followed by endpoint. followed by a point container and that's going to be pushed into the path mapper function which will go into a point container itself. Okay, so let's connect these up. 
B into curve, curve into C, E into point. And you can see already it's highlighted. If I click on the outgoing endpoint point container, you can see all the highlights of the endpoints here. Now, to stop confusion, I'm going to switch the preview off for all of those, including that particular point one, because all we need is the final one for now. Okay, I'm going to double click on this now. Now we see we've got a source and a target. In the source, we're going to be putting A in, um, forgive me, I do not know the proper name for them, but the weird brackets. If you do shift and click on the square brackets, that's where they are in a standard Windows QWERTY keyboard. So A in the weird brackets, and then I in the curly bracket. And then in the targets, we're doing I backslash three within the weird brackets. And then, okay. We put points in and we should get points out. Now, the reason this is coming up red is because we haven't flattened the endpoint here on the curve. Now, for some reason, despite the list already being flat, it throws up an error. I encountered this before. Don't ask me why. It's Grasshopper being Grasshopper. Sometimes we just need to treat it gently and hope for the best. So we have isolated our particular endpoints and we've regrouped them into our respective branch groups. This is what the path mapper or lexical operation we have done here is doing. What this is telling it is to take the input points and to divide them by three and to put them into their own groups. We know they're three because we've had three branches. Now, Unfortunately, there isn't an automatic way for this to update, so if you change the number of branches, you will have to manually update this particular variable each time. But for now, this is what we need. So, if we save and we move on to step three. Now, with step three, we're building the low-poly representative mesh that's going to be created from this particular set of lines, but more specifically through the Delune connectivity of these outer endpoints here. Now, to do that, we're going to be using WeaverBird as well as Delune operations. So first things first, I'm just going to toggle those points off. Now, if we type in param pipe mesh, And suddenly you see a lot of variables. Do not panic. All we are concerned about are C and R. R I'm going to do between 0, 0.0 and 1.0, which seems reasonable enough. Basically, two meter thick trunk maximum. And I'm going to set R to 0.5. Now, the curve, that is coming from our trunk. So if we go back to the trunk variable at the top, drag the endpoint into the curve, and I'm going to do the usual by display and high. That's the trunk done. We can forget about the trunk for now. Next, we need to do the Delano cell and edit that so that we only have the outer faces. OK. So next we need closest points. So type in and closest points, plural. Now for both P and C, we're gonna be using the isolated points that we got from the second part. However, with C, we need to flatten the input. And then I'm going to go and wide display and hide both again. Now, point output, and then Delaunay 3D cell, 3D Delaunay cell, there we go. 
and we flatten the point input. And suddenly we have this significant object generated. Now we need to edit this. So firstly we're going to unify mesh. This just unifies all the normals to make it slightly less janky when we come to rendering. Now we want Weaver Bird join. Weaver Bird join meshes and well. So we're going to need a Boolean toggle. And that Boolean toggle is just going to go into the world, and we want world true. So the mesh output, which is the R, goes into the M+. Plus. Now, with that done, that output is going to go into a mesh container. We want to explode the mesh, and we also want to find the face normals of the mesh. So if we type in the face N, and then if we type in explode mesh. So we can see all of those points now highlighted. Those are the center points of the face normals. Now we want to cull these, cull duplicates. So the output of face N gets flattened, and C goes into P. Then we want list item. The F of explode goes into the L of list item, and the I from call point goes into the I of item. And then this goes into another Weaver Bird join. And if we throw in the same toggle, and then the eye goes out. Now, I'm just going to switch preview off of those, and now you can see suddenly we only have pretty much the outer faces only. Now, for whatever reason, there always seems to be this random internal triangle that I cannot seem to get rid of. If someone else finds a way, you're awesome. Um, and please let everybody else know. So, next up, we're doing one final Weaver Bird join. This time, unifying the canopy and the trunk. So, first thing, trunk, drag into M+. Plus and then hold the shift key down and drag the M outputs of the previous Weaver Bird join into the final Weaver Bird join. And there we have it, our unified mesh. Now, the one other thing I forgot to mention, in the param pipe mesh, the E end type, we want it flat. So set integer and one. And now it's going to be a solid mesh and mesh output. And on the M+, plus, we want that to be flattened as well. So there we go. Sanity check. One locally defined mesh, and there you have it. That was step three. And the next step is using a bounding box and fits circle points to find the approximate area on a two-dimensional plane that these meshes take up, which will then be put into the Galapagos function later. So, at this point I'm going to pull a blue Peter and do, here's one I made earlier. I outputted 12 variants just to test the function, and I'm going to be using these 12 in the next part. So I've internalized their mesh data, so I have the meshes in here already. And at this point, I'm going to turn the preview off here. And I'm also going to disable those functions. So moving on to step four. First up, we start off quite gently. And we want bounding box. Now, we actually want to graft the input here, the various variants, and ooh, 
suddenly all of the bounding boxes. You can see I went for some really large ones and some really small ones too. So that should give us a good enough variety for the next. So next we want to deconstruct the box. D box, not B box, or B bop. Sorry, I'm rather infamous for my puns. Um, forgive me. And then we want to deconstruct the main. We're going to need two of these, and we're going to need four construct points. So if we just do copy, there we go. Okay, so in the deconstruct box, the X and the Y go into their own you know, deconstruct domains, and then the S and the E go into separate X and Y points, respectively. Then we want fit circle, or circle fit, and then those points, again, using the shift and drag, Pop them in, in order, top to bottom, into F circle. And then we want the expression function again, because you want to calculate the area. We can get rid of one variable. Double click, and we want to type in pi, which is up here in the constants. Asterix, which is short for times, and R to the power of 2. Rename the input R, rename the output area, bring R into R. Then we want to trim the tree by 1, so trim, trim tree. D is automatically set to 1, and that's all we need to trim it by. And then if I put a panel here, you can see it's calculated all the areas. And there we go. So that was step four, blissfully simple. Step five is also quite simple, but it gets messy with the number of nah, functions we're using. This is why I was showing you the hide points earlier, sorry, hide line thing earlier, because um, we'll be needing to use that a lot in the next session. So. On to step number five, and this is where we bring Galapagos into play. First things first, we want to bang. Explode tree. Now, we bring all of these areas we calculated down into the D, and then we right click on the bang and click match outputs. That's the quickest way to ensure that all of these outputs are the same number as the inputs. So we are going to need 12 lots of number slider and multiplier. Fortunately, we can just create one of each and copy. So number slider, I'm just going to put in a variable between 0 and 48. You can notice I'm doing a multiple of 12. That's for a reason. Then multiplication. Now, at this point, I'm going to rename both slider. And R. So that when we're copying and pasting them, we can make sure we know which branch is going to which multiplier. That's going to save you a headache later on. So I'm just going to copy these up now. And as I said, we need 12 in total. I'm going to put them into groups of four because it's slightly easier to array them as such. Now drag them into each and then rename accordingly and rinse and repeat until you're done. OK. With that done, we need two mass addition functions. So double click, type in mass addition. We want two of these. The first one is dealing with the number of tree types. So we're using shift drag again and we're dragging each of these number sliders in order 
oops, into the eye of the mass addition function. Making sure they're in order is important because it affects a significant number of processes later. So it's good habit to get into it now. And then this mass addition function is dealing with the area. So again, we bring them in in order one by one. You can see already it's getting uh, very convoluted with the number of lines we have going on here. So I am going to Y display, hide, Y display, and hide. I'm now going to rename this function input as number three types and output as number trees required. And this one as areas and output as area of trees. Now the next function we're using is similar, similarity. So this is how we're using Galapagos. So what we're wanting to do is find out how many trees we need to fit the particular boundary area of the woodland we're generating. This provides us two things. Firstly, it reduces the poly count. Secondly, it provides us a relatively quick and easy way to um, provide an aesthetic of woodland without us having to go in and manually figure out how many points we need for it to look good. Along with the distribution of tree types. So, I'm going to put two panels here. Showing the outputs of both. Now, threshold is at 1%, that's fine, because we can also manually set the threshold in Galapagos too. So, we're going to need our woodland boundary. So, if we put in a curved container here, and we put in area. So this is our woodland boundary. Now we've got the area here. That area goes into B. The mass area of trees goes into A. Now we want to flatten the input here on the areas and then we want our Galapagos function. So the fitness variable, that is our absolute difference. So we drive from fitness onto absolute difference. Our genome, that is these sliders. So again, we're wanting to drag them using the shift key onto each slider. And make sure you're careful to click the right point. So if we go back into Rhino for a second, switch our viewpoints, bring us back to Our mesh. Now, if we hide the mesh, and we can, I'm just going to use the smaller of the woodland boundaries to demonstrate. So we select the woodland boundary, and we right-click, set one curve and woodland boundary, and here we go. So I'm now just going to switch the preview off for all of these. Okay, so we save and we double click on Galapagos and that brings up the Galapagos function. Now I'm just going to bring this over here so you can see how it functions. Now 
we want to minimize the fitness threshold and threshold I'm going to just put as an arbitrary 100. You can enable runtime limits and then with the solver I just start solver. I'm using the standard evolutionary solver rather than the annealing solver. So if we start and you can see already that Galapagos is moving these sliders for us, going through numerous iterations, trying to figure out what the best fit is for all of these particular meshes. So this can take anywhere from seconds to minutes. It's not taking me more than maybe two to three minutes. Um, again, the number, or the, sorry, the area will obviously depend because the larger the area, the longer it will take. And this has taken, what, 10 seconds, just about. So click OK, and that's given us our distribution we need. So that is step five done. Step six is where we source out the point distribution. And this is where we start to look into grass, uh, kangaroo. So first things first. I'm going to use the radii of our trees to create some sort of relationship with the sphere collision module we'll be using. So I'm just going to do that first. And we're going to do both weighted average and average. So you can pick which one you prefer to use. and we want two number containers. Now, we're flattening the input of both because we're just looking at the number rather than the tree format. So, weights, self-explanatory. Okay, so what we're going to need to do is do the same drag and Again, so weights go into the weights and areas into the areas. Now, what we can do with the areas, because we've calculated them previously on mass, you can go back to our trim up here. We can just connect that in. We flatten these, and then I'm going to do the same thing, wide display and hide. And then weight is going to go into here, and areas are going to go into I and I. And then we want to calculate the radii from these, or radius, in fact, because it's the average now. So if we type an expression again, we can get rid of a variable. And this time, we're doing open brackets, a divided by pi. And then power of 0.5. Now, for those of you not as keen on your maths, power to 0 0.5 is the same as square rooting. Same as power to a third is the same as cube rooting, power to a fourth, etc., etc., etc. And then we didn't just click OK. Input A, output R and we get our radii. Then I put in another control, a division control. Number slider one to four. And that just fine tunes the relationship somewhat. Because I sometimes find that even um, having the radius here and going in full, it sometimes just makes the solver a little bit unfriendly. And you can end up with points outside parameters, even though we're using a curved collider as well. So I'm just going to put that in and divide it by 4. So we can hide that and put that to one side for a second. OK, so again, the next thing we need is to use the boundary curve. So curve container, we already have it. So I'm just putting it in, in here so we can keep the separate parts. Mm. 
Now we want an area function again. We want a boundary function, boundary surfaces. And then we want a pop geometry. And that's the bounding geometry, that bound in the bounding surface. So if we switch the previews for those off. So we have that pop geom function. And now we're going to put in the various kangaroo bits we need. So in kangaroo 2, if you go to goals col or collide, and we want curve point collide, and we want our sphere collide, and if we go to goals PT, we want bomb. Um, and then in the main, we want bouncy solver. We're going to have a few boolean toggles here, so if we just type in boolean toggle, if we just copy couple and we want a button as well. So this is going to be our reset button, that's going to be our sim toggle. And this is going to be our toggle for ensuring that the CPC is acting on the interior rather than the exterior. So if we connect resets up to bouncy solver and to bomb reset as well, and sim run to the bouncy solver, and then interior to IN here and I'm just going to go ahead and hide these again. Right, so firstly in PopGeo, we need to know the number of them. So if we type in a number container and we want to know the number of trees required. So this is what we were doing up here. So number of trees we need is So I'm just going to rename this and I'm going to hide the Y display again. And then we plug that into the end of Geom. And then again, we've got a random seed value. Go crazy. And then in our bomb, we want a location and we want points in both CPC and SC. So the points also in the bomb, so drag the P and we're just putting points to act on in each of them. Now, the R from SC comes from the radio, radius we were doing earlier. And then we want the location for the bomb, which I'm going to take as the center of our woodland boundary. So from the C of the area, that calculates the centroid as well push that into the location. Now, detonation and strength, detonation says when in the solving process, so I'm just gonna say that as naught. And then strength, we want a slider for strength, I'm gonna have as anywhere between 0, 0.0 and 4.0, and I'm gonna set it to one to start with. And same with surface, although I'm going to set the cap, for, sorry, the sphere um, as two as the cap for that. So if we drag those two in, and then for the curve for CPC, that's our woodland boundary. And again, we want a strength function for CPC as well. I've set it to an arbitrary 10, but you can use a slider. Now, with all of these solvers set, 
what we're then going to do is plug them into the goal objects of the Bounty Solver. Now, the damping for Bouncy Solver is between 0 0.00 and 1 and 1.00, and I'm going to set to 10 as 0.99. Iterations, that tells you how many iterations will be performed before it shows you an update visually in Rhino. You can set it to whatever you want. I've set it to 10 in this instance, but I'm probably going to set it down to maybe 4. Threshold is when it stops. I'm going to increase the threshold to 0.1. And tolerance is when the point snap. Because we're looking at trunks and everything, I'm actually going to change the point tolerance to 0 0.5 because that means within half a meter the points are going to be um, counted as one, um, which kind of makes sense when you think of root systems and the like. I mean, really maybe wider, but for all intents and purposes here, that will do. Now, we're going to need to do a brief cleanup stage afterwards, so we're wanting the call duplicates function, closest point function, and then call in depth. Now, we want the centroid of our wooden boundary, and that goes into P. The output of call P goes into C, and the I from CP goes into the I of call, and again the P from call point goes into the L of call index. And then the output from the bouncy solver goes into the V. What that does is that removes the um, bomb point, which is extraneous and we do not need. So, now that's set up, I'm just going to bring that down so it's not in the way as much. Now I'm going to hide this and I'm going to zoom in and we can see how this works. So if I click reset and then I set it to run. So I've changed the strength of the sphere glide to 0 0.1 because it didn't seem to do anything. So I'm going to reset again and run. And it's still not really seeming to do anything. So let's see if we change the detonation time. So not to say 10. And set the slider to 10. Reset and true. If we change the th threshold to 0 0.01 and reset. Okay, after some quick troubleshooting, I realized what was going on. So, this threshold um, that will change depending on the complexity of the simulation. So, I've now set it to in point. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, also known as 1e e to the minus 5. And iterations I've changed to number of 10 um, for you know, visual purposes. I've also adjusted the detonation time. And if we reset and run, and then if I play with the detonation time, that will trigger the simulation to do what it needs to do. Kangaroo can sometimes be a little bit fiddly. But now that's done, now our points are randomized again. We can disable the simulation, hide that, and this is what simulation looks like without the extraneous point. So now we can move on. And the final step, and that is distributing the trees we've generated along these points and making sure that these points are projected onto the terrain. So to that end, 
we start off with train mesh and the cold points list and the project command. So we want a mesh container. And we want a point container. And we want a project command. Project point. Now, one thing to point out, this isn't like the Rhino command in that Rhino will project just along the z-axis, either plus or minus, it doesn't matter. With the Grasshopper, it's just asking you specifically whether it's going to project positively or negatively along the z-axis. Now, these points are actually below our terrain mesh, so this means we actually need to project them positively. So I'm just going to manage vector collection and then I'm going to change that Z to 1 rather than minus 1 and that will do us. So if I change the point container to um, to generate a point and mesh to terrain mesh okay the mesh goes into G points into P and then we can drag that into the points container. I'm going to hide that now, and I'm going to do the same Y display and hide and hide that. Now, terrain mesh, we can set one mesh, click our terrain, and there we go. And oh, hide the mesh rather than disable the mesh. So there we go. We can see our points have now been projected onto that mesh. So that's the easy part. Next we need to sort the trees out. So we need the weights and the variance. So if we do a mesh container and a number container go to partition, so type in partition, and we want partition list, we want null item, and then we want dispatch. So what this does is this groups our trees by their weights and removes any naught or null values from our particular weight listing. So weights go into S. The L is from the P for project. Now what we do with C is we simplify the output from C. And then C goes into the I of null as well as the L of dispatch. And the X from null goes into the P of dispatch. Now we want to flatten the output of B because that's where our and finalized output's going to be. Now, with our variance and with our weights, so the variance are coming from this container at the top here, and our weights are coming from this container here. And I'm going to hide both again. With the variance, we in fact want to graft the input. Now we want to stack and we're going to move them according to our weight distribution. So stack data, move to point, this is a pufferfish command, move to point. Our origin is simple, it is in fact the world origin. So if we just do a point container, we're going to go to manage point collection and do add item, and that's just going to give us a standard 0, 0, 0. And there. And that's what we need from there. And then B is going to be from the B of dispatch. S for stack is coming from the weights and the variance going into D and then G. Now what we want to do is no, 
I actually made a mistake in my own notes. We do not need to graft the true variance. So remove the graft, right click on variance and remove the graft. Now, from this point here, we're going to add in a rotational randomization to these trees. So we need the domain, so construct domain. And again, number slider, naught to one, times two of those, and one, start naught. We want a list length, because we want to know what the length of the moved list is. And then we want a random function. So Schroden as kitten. And then again, seed slider, go crazy. And that goes into the S. Length goes into the number and domain goes into random. We're using 0 to 1 because we're working radians. So next function we want is expression again. We want singular input. And we want to be a very simple expression. It is literally x multiplied by pi. And that gives us a set of radians. Now we want rotate 3D. We want our unit Z. So we know we're rotating on the Z axis at each point. We want our points. Just C. We want our radians A and we want our, oh sorry, M goes into G not C. And then this center here, this is our generated points. And now we have rotational randomization. Mesh container, output, preview off, preview off, bake, grasshopper export, group, yes. Switch mesh on, minimize grasshopper window, through Antarctic, and congratulations. You have generated yourself a randomized woodland without needing to use any proprietary 3D blocks other than the ones you have just generated yourself. So, let us recap, because we have covered an awful lot of ground. Our first step was creating a recursive generator to ensure that we had some form of randomized tree form using branches and being able to randomize the number of branches and their orientation. Step two was isolating our endpoints of the branches to ensure that we could then use them in future operations. Step three was building a low poly mesh representation using Weaverbird and Delaney algorithms. Step four was using the generated meshes to calculate bounding boxes and then approximate two-dimensional area that these meshes took up. Then we used Galapagos to calculate the types and distribution of these particular tree variants to ensure that they didn't take up much more space than was available, which helped us reduce poly count and also reduce the complexity. Step six, using Kangaroo, we further randomized the generation and distribution of the trees physically on the model. 
and step seven, using all prior elements, we added in rotational randomization to the distribution of the trees and created within Rhino our output of trees. So I'm going to be using this particular method to generate the woodland areas along the wider landscape in our final tutorial on these photographic aesthetics. So I hope you found this useful and I hope it wasn't too long. Any questions please put in the comments below and as mentioned this work was itself based upon work done by others. By all means check them out. Um, I have glossed over um, certain background to these particular functions for brevity and efficiency's sake. So if you want to learn more, go ahead and have a look at the tutorials linked. Same with the lexical operations. And as always, thank you for listening.